Welcome to DEF CON. <clears throat> All right. Oh. Can you guys believe that the hackers have been coming to the city, the desert for 25 times now? Give yourselves a round of applause for coming to the desert 25 years. <laughs> so uh, I believe we're making history here. This is the first time sitting congressmen have been to uh, officially, in an official capacity, as speakers at uh, the largest hacker conference in the world. So that, to me, looks like some progress. Um, we're going to do some introductions in a minute. Uh, first things first, we're going to do a little framing to explain why we were able to get um, these two distinguished uh, public servants to our uh, conference. So we've been coming here 25 years and we are not necessarily a single tribe and a lot of the outside world thinks a hacker equals a criminal. And I think over the last few years we've been turning that tide and now they understand there's uh, Hacking is just a form of power, it's like magic, and we can use it for good, for ill, for any number of purposes. And one of the ways we've been trying to turn that tide is explaining why we do what we do. And we all have different motives, not everybody in here is the same, but you know, alliteration works, short lists work, so we have these five Ps. We basically say some people are protectors. They wanna get stuff fixed, they wanna make the world a safer place. Some people are puzzlers. That's why most of us got into this in the first place, right? We want to tinker. We want to take it apart. We want to put it back together. We're curious. Curiosity is our original motivation. Some of us do this because we want to win the white jacket or we want to be famous. We do it for prestige or for pride. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's allowing us to achieve great things. Some of us do this for profit or personal or professional gain. And we make a career out of it. And some of us do this for protest, for or against some ideological cause that we care deeply about, ideally within the bounds of the laws. So whether you're motivated by being a protector, a puzzler, a prestige, profit, or protest, you know, we're complicated individuals, but there's a reason you got into this in the first place. And there's a reason you stay in it. So for my part, I wanna make the world a safer place. So I'm first and foremost a protector. And like, luckily over the last several years, we've met several of you that feel the same. But you know, I also like hard problems, so I'm a bit of a puzzler as well. And uh, we're gonna ask these congressmen when during their intros, why did you get into public service in the first place? What's your motivation? Now, in the spirit of that, four years ago here at DEF CON, we launched I Am The Cavalry. This was the idea that could we be a voice of a reason, an ambassador, a translator? Should we bring DEF CON to DC? Should we try to be a voice of translating the things that we care about, specifically wherever there's issues of public safety and human life? The idea is, could we shift from being a pointing finger at past failure to a helping hand towards future success? Could we stop celebrating failure and what's wrong with something? Could we look for what's right with something? Uh, and, and through that, we focus more on empathy and communication than we did on breaking things. And because of that, we've slowly, slowly made ourselves accessible to public policymakers. And whether you guys knew this or not, over the last two years, there are 18 parts of the US government who enthusiastically support and encourage the use of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So not only is what you're doing not criminalized in all cases, and we're slowly turning the tide on that with things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act exemptions, but they also see us as a vital resource and a teammate if done right. One of these two gentlemen on stage on the floor of Congress said, go hack the Pentagon. So I think we're turning the tide and this is something I think it's worth a little bit of cheers for yourselves and for others. Now there's a long way to go. Uh, last year was pretty hot for first-of-a-kind policy engagement on cybersecurity issues. Yes, I said cyber, but A, I did my friggin' shot, and B, uh, this is the language they speak on the Hill, and if we want to be effective, you know, when, when you're in France, you speak French, right? So we have to harmonize the way we speak about things. But in the legislative and executive branch alone, we saw the Food and Drug Administration really tighten up things like medical device cyber safety. We saw the Department of Transportation do this. We saw Commerce encourage disclosure and patching best practices. DHS, White House. And Congress themselves also asked, almost presciently, they said, we're concerned about overconnectivity and security risks in our healthcare, which is a sixth of our economy. So while we were all talking about information sharing in the CISA Act of 2015, 
They also asked for a one-year congressional task force, and in that, they wanted a, a diverse number of stakeholders to say how risky is connected medicine. And on June of this year, we published this. They actually made sure they wanted a voice of hackers. So I am the cavalry and a lot of the hacker community got to participate in this one year long task force. Now I'm gonna say some stuff that's a little scary so we can ground this group in why we're having them here today. So of the many things we found, the punchline was that healthcare is in uh, critical condition. And whether you can read this graphic or not, the five things on the front page of this report are essentially about 85% of our US health delivery organizations lack a single qualified secure, security person on staff. That should scare everybody. And this is not a US only problem. We talked with our international partners. Number two, we're, we tend to be defending legacy XP or older in the, leg, in, the, in the clinical environment. So these things are well past their end of life and they're no longer supported. Number three, they tend to be overconnected to each other and reachable by the outside world which means that a single flaw in a single device can take out an entire hospital, as you saw with Hollywood Presbyterian last February. And moreover, the average device in the clinical environment has over a thousand known vulnerabilities. So put those together. Most of our hospitals lack a single one of you. You're defending harder to defend things. They're overconnected to each other and reachable by the outside world. A single flaw in a single device took out patient care at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. And the average device may give us a thousand chances to do it. We've done amazing things over the last 25 years, but we need more of you to help us solve these wicked problems. And if there wasn't a sense of urgency as we were publishing this report back to Congress, WannaCry took out 65 hospitals in a single day in the UK. That was 20% of their national capacity. You know people died from degraded and delayed patient care. So I wanna call out to the best of you as we reach out to the best of them, and in the spirit of that, I think we've proven the model can work over the last four years, bringing DEF CON to DC. In fact, some of us have actually quit our day jobs and moved into think tanks like the Atlantic Council and whatnot. And now we've brought part of DC here to DEF CON in a way that hasn't been done before. And I am honored and humbled that we have two sitting members of our democratic process here. So please, I'll introduce them in a moment, but let's give it a huge round of applause for these two pioneers. All right, we're gonna try to keep an eye on the hashtag if you wanna send me your poll answers and whatnot. Uh, DEF CON, DC to DEF CON. Uh, first, uh, Representative Jim Langevin, uh, he will give his own intro, um, but I was uh, really excited to work with him as the chair and founder, co-chair of the Cyber Caucus in uh, the House of Representatives, and also Representative Hurd uh, of Texas, who uh, also a very strong and leading and informed voice on cybersecurity issues, and I'll let you, them tell you their origin stories. But please, gentlemen, weave in which of the motivations do you carry to public service? So, you first, Representative Landrin. All right. Well, thank you very much, Josh, for the, uh, the introduction, for the invitation uh, to join you today. And, um, and uh, I wanna thank both uh, you and, and DEF CON, and let me also recognize Bo and uh, the Atlantic Council uh, for everything you did to, to make our visit here possible. And uh, let me just say to the, uh, to the security researchers community, thank you all for what you do. And uh, I know that collaboratively together, we're gonna make a difference in this, uh, in this field and we're gonna make the, uh, the internet much more secure uh, than it is today uh, and we're gonna do it together. So I thank you for that. I know it's a challenging uh, uh, environment for sure, a dynamic one, uh, but I find it, uh, it really an amazing topic to work on. Uh, I am thrilled to be here with my my colleague, uh, Will Hurd. Uh, Will and I serve on the uh, Homeland Security Committee together. Uh, and, uh, and, and let uh, it be recognized here that I can tell you bipartisanship is not dead on the hill. Uh, there are pockets of it that still exist. And, and guys like uh, Will and I hopefully are helping to set a, uh, an example and, and, and helping to raise the bar so that uh, we can show that by working together, that's how we truly get things done. So it's great to be here with my colleague. So. You can clap. You can clap for that. <laughs> so, 
So just briefly, a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a uh, congressman from the second district in Rhode Island. I'm in my ninth term in Congress. And I sit on uh, both the uh, as a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee and a founding member and senior member of the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, in all of that work, I specialize in, in cybersecurity and, uh, and the ranking member on the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee on Armed Services. And we have primary jurisdiction over uh, NSA and US Cyber Command. And on uh, the Homeland Security Committee, I sit on the subcommittee on cybersecurity and infrastructure protection. But I have to tell you, I kind of fell into this, uh, this world of, of being involved in cybersecurity uh, a better part of uh, a decade ago when I was the, the chairman of the subcommittee on uh, emerging threats, cybersecurity, and science and technology. And originally, I thought we were going to be focusing mainly on the, uh, the emerging threats part of the responsibility, which is to look at all the, uh, the most serious threats to the face of the country, such as chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats to, uh, to America and our allies. And then uh, one day my staff director uh, came in to me on the subcommittee and said, uh, said uh, boss, you've got to get a, a briefing on this thing called uh, the Aurora threat, uh, by two, found, discovered by two uh, researchers at Idaho National Labs where they found a vulnerability into, uh, into a critical infrastructure through a, uh, a skater attack. And hence, everyone now knows that as the, uh, the Aurora uh, threat. But uh, I was riveted by the video that showed how a generator operating normally, uh, all of a sudden, because of a uh, uh, malicious code that was remotely inserted, uh, caused this generator to spin up out of control and then basically shake itself apart. And, uh, and that was just a, a small example of what could happen to, uh, to our uh, electric grid and uh, potentially shutting down a whole portion of uh, our country's electric uh, grid if, uh, if a successful uh, widespread skater attack were ever to be carried out. So that is how my, my interest in cyber uh, uh, began. And just to, to close out, uh, from there we uh, were asked, uh, Mike McCall and I, uh, my co-founder and co-chair of the Cybersecurity Caucus, Mike now chairs the full Homeland Security Committee, but he's been a great again, bipartisan partner in this, in this effort uh, to enhance our nation's cybersecurity. Uh, he and I were asked to chair, be co-chairs of a national commission, the CSIS Commission on Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency, which became the foundational document for President Obama as he charted the nation's cybersecurity uh, blueprint and plan going forward. And, um, and then we also, as you know, founded the, uh, co-founded the Cybersecurity Caucus. And when we originally started in this field, I have to tell you, we got a lot of funny looks. Mike and I, uh, we felt like kind of uh, lone voices in the wilderness and uh, people did not understand the, the, what we were so worked up about. Uh, they get it now. Uh, times have certainly changed. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do. Clearly, the, the awareness has been raised, but now we've got to continue to work together to close the vulnerabilities. So that is uh, just briefly, uh, probably went on too long, sorry. But um, that's, uh, that's my introduction uh, to the cybersecurity challenges that the nation faces. And, uh, and uh, we need to continue work in progress. But uh, I've been uh, really uh, gratified to know that there are people like you in the, in the, in the security research community uh, who are doing important work, discovering vulnerabilities. And I'm hoping that we continue to forge stronger partnerships uh, to help to do something about it when we find those vulnerabilities. And uh, as I said, I know that we're going to be able to do this together. Will's been a great partner in this, uh, this effort, and uh, I'm pleased to again share the stage with him. But I want to thank you for your invitation, and it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you. Which P are you, Jim? The, the, put, the li put the list back up. Yep, I'm the one the the one wants to be the uh, one that fixes things. It's yeah. it's definitely not prestige, right? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah that's the, when when you have a nine percent job approval rating, um, yeah. that's not prestige. Um, yeah. Anyways, not us individually back home, obviously, <laughs> right? right? But as as a it's body, as a body, yeah. am I too far away from this? How we get that echo out? Anyone? 
pull it back this way. Um, well, again, thanks for having us here. This is uh, my second time uh, to, to, to DEF CON, and I always take a lot away um, from the interactions that, that we have, uh, especially on the sidelines of, of many of these events. And I appreciate the Atlantic Council for making this happen and getting us I'm out here to Las Vegas. Um, let me see a show of hands. How many, this is, if this is your first DEF CON? Okay, wow, a lot of noobs. A lot of noobs. yeah, give it up for the newbies. How, how many's been here over five years? Okay, o over 10? We got any of the originals? No, no originals? What, DT ain't here? D DT didn't want to come uh, here they're, they're all on duty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you just came here because you drank too much last night and need someone cold, cold to hang out? Anyone? Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate the honesty. Um, so I'm from San Antonio, born and raised. And um, a lot of San Antonians, there you go. Um, and my, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to take an internship at the Southwest Research Institute. And I had a female engineer that exposed me, yeah, female engineers, give it up, uh, exposed me to robotics and is, is the reason that I started, first got interested in computer science and I studied it at Texas A&M and yeah, whoop, Giga Maggies, it's our year, it's our year, uh, watch out Alabama. Um, and so also if you need a Turbo Pascal or Fortran programmer, let me know. Um, I, still, I still know a few things. And I, I had the opportunity when I graduated, I went into the CIA. Um, I was a case officer. Uh, I did two years in Washington, D.C. at what I used to call the super secret CIA training facility called The Farm. Uh, now it's on Google Maps. And uh, uh, two years in India, two years in Pakistan, two years in New York City, a year and a half in Afghanistan where I managed all of our undercover operations. So I was the dude in the back alleys at four o'clock in the morning collecting um, intelligence on threats to our homeland. And I also had to brief members of Congress. Had I met a guy like Jim, I probably would have stayed in the CIA. Um, I unfortunately had not been exposed to Jim and Mike McCall and Ted Lieu from, from California, uh, folks that really understand the issues that they're, that they're talking about. And so I was frustrated with the caliber of our elected officials, and so I ran for Congress in 2010, and I lost. <laughs> um, <laughs> why does that always get a, get a laugh? I, I, still, I still don't understand that. Um, and it, I lost a runoff by 700 votes. And it's not a lot of votes, and it's even worse after you've been to the grocery store for the two months afterwards, and people came up to you, like, how's the campaign? And, um, like, I lost. They're like, oh, shucks, we forgot to, to vote, you know? Um, <laughs> I, I literally ran into 740 people uh, that, like that. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to, to work for a company called Crumpton Group, a uh, boutique consulting firm, and I helped uh, Matt DeVoe uh, with and build Fusion X. And so if, if you don't like anything that I do, see Matt DeVoe. Um, he, I, everything I've learned in this, about this industry, I've learned from, I've learned from DeVoe. And he's, a, he's, he's, he's been a good friend. And so understanding penetration testing, technical vulnerability assessment, things like that, understanding the talent that's outside of the government, um, understanding the threat that individuals and companies are, are faced, it was a great experience and to be able to leverage that when I got in Congress. And so 14, I ran again. Uh, nobody, everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, nobody thought the black dude would win in a Hispanic district. And I uh, represent a 71% Hispanic district. And it's been an opportunity to work on issues like cybersecurity. And that means in Washington, D.C., it actually means information sharing. Um, we should have passed the Cybersecurity Act of 2015, 10 years ago, um, but we finally, we finally got something done. Um, we we look, focus on privacy, and you know, I, I said yesterday, I don't know which crypto war we're on right now, um, but we should be strengthening encryption, not weakening it. Um, <laughs> Our, 
our, our civil liberties are not burdens. They are the things that make our country great. And we, we, we can chase bad guys, we can defend our digital infrastructure, and we can protect our civil liberties all at the same time. It's hard. And one of the things that, I have to, that, that Jim and I have to do when we educate our colleagues is to let them know that, um, guess what, there's really no such thing as an impenetrable device. <laughs> You know, uh, come out to DEF CON if you, if you don't believe us. And, and so we have to get to a point where we can do security and protect privacy at the same time. And this conversation is to go back and forth, right? This is, there's, this is always the topic of backdoors and encryption is always going to be out there. And you're going to have to continue to, to, to fight, those, um, fight that back. And having the support of folks like y'all is, is really important to do that. And I, I will say everybody knows now what OPM stands for. Yeah. Right. Uh, as 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 Lindsey Graham says, mucho bad. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's that brought a consciousness to this issue that everybody understands the importance of protecting our digital infrastructure, and our colleagues understand that, but they don't always necessarily understand the nuance. And that's why, you know, we try to educate. That's why having y'all is important. You know, many of our colleagues um, think that direct messaging on Twitter is the dark web, you know. Um, it's like, well, no, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but there, there is a, there is, there's an interest in understanding that topic. And so um, I always get nervous when, when someone says, oh, I'm an expert on anything, and let alone cybersecurity, especially being in a room with, with folks like y'all. Um, but coming out here helps um, you know, prevent our knowledge base from getting stale. So, so I appreciate uh, y'all have been, everybody's been super nice to, to both of us. I think everybody's a little worried that we might have gotten attacked or something when we, when we got here. Um, but it really is, it really, y'all have opened, welcomed us with open arms and your willingness to help us understand the big issues and the small issues. And I'm looking forward to talking more about some of those big strategy things that we have to get right before we're able to do um, some, of the, some of the small things. So thank you all. All right, your friendly reminder, I put out a Twitter poll. It's got probably 20 minutes left, maybe 10, uh, on which topics I should prioritize amongst uh, Mirai botnets, wanna cry hitting hospitals, power impacts, or lost in our export controls that may affect our ability to do our jobs uh, internationally. So please vote. I'm gonna keep an eye on it for one of our last questions. So um, yesterday we had a pretty full lineup. These guys are, are, are uh, very robust in their ability to take in information. We, we had a lot of briefings yesterday. We uh, took them on a walking tour of many of the, the villages downstairs. Uh, we saw what, uh, hack, auto hacking village, lockpick village, IOT, industrial controls, the, the voting machine roots. hacking, the kids, yeah. roots yeah. hackers. So, um, you know, I know you're both pretty savvy on cybersecurity, but what was, uh, what really stood out? What was your biggest surprise? And what kind of things might you be able to act upon when you get back to DC if you want to continue this cooperation? Um, what was I, the, the things that I was surprised by is the, the voting machines, right? And the fact that what all 24 got dismantled in less than six hours. Um, that is, that is a, a huge problem. Um, we have to ensure um, that the American people can trust their vote tabulating process. And now, the machine is just one step in that process, but I think the work that has been done out here is important to educating the secretaries of state um, all across the country, as well as the election administrators, uh, the people that are tasked with doing this. And, and a lot of times, you know, uh, I have a county that's the second least populated county in the United States of America. 95 people in the entire county. I've met 72 of them. Um, and, and they don't have a cybersecurity professional to help them, you know, manage that process. And so figuring out how um, the states and these election commissioners 
uh, election administrators are, are understand the risk and vulnerabilities is important. So that was important. Um, things that we can take away, I, I'm interested in doing a, a hearing on um, the five points, um, the five points when it comes to, when it comes to uh, connected cars. Um, it, is, it is an area um, that I think we have to have a little bit more conversation around because I want to ensure that we don't create a overly burdensome regulatory environment around some of these issues. And I think connected cars is the subsection of IoT that most members can get their heads around. Uh, but it's such a, a, a broader conversation. And how do we prevent, I don't want the government to get in the way. I want the government to be able to facilitate and to allow entrepreneurship to grow. But we, we all know we have to bake in security. Um, let's not make the same mistakes that we've made in the creation of the internet, let's not make those same mistakes when it comes to when it comes to to IoT. Um, and those those are and, and look learning about TLS 1.3 and y'all's opinion on that. Um, y'all's opinion on what is the future of quantum computing and the you know how quickly is that going to get here on some kind of commercial scale and how do you defend um, against quantum computing? These, these conversations are going to lead um, me to hold hearings on, on many of these topics uh, through the subcommittee that I chair. Excellent, thank you. So the thing that surprised me the most, um, so um, when I, well you know, many of you have seen me riding around and I, I use a, uh, an iBot wheelchair to get around and uh, you can pop it up on two wheels, same inventor as a Segway scooter, Dean Kamen, a brilliant. Uh, inventor. Uh, the thing that surprised me the most is that when I went into the car hacking room that someone didn't find a way to hack into my system and start driving me around. So <laughs> I did wonder if it was going to happen and it actually, uh, it's, a, it's a sophisticated piece of technology and I don't uh, pretend to understand all the magic but I know it has six gyroscopes that keep it balanced and uh, I did put it down on four wheels just in case. So. <laughs> But uh, it He's here for four more hours, yeah, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was the thing I suppose that surprised me most that didn't happen. But uh, it's a good thing. Um, but uh, I have to say that I too was um, uh, a, a, a surprised and though not shocked by uh, the uh, the election uh, voting systems and. It, apparently how, how easily those systems could be compromised and hacked. Uh, I, I knew that they were, the electronic voting systems are uh, potentially vulnerable and I, certainly I've heard the reports. How easy it was though was, was an eye opener. So I, I was a former Secretary of State as well and before that I served for six years in the Rhode Island General Assembly as a state rep and I actually chaired a special legislative commission on purchasing new voting equipment. and. The one thing, although I, I love technology and I was impressed by uh, the DRE equipment, the touch screen at the, back then at the time, I could never get past the, the fear, the concern that, you know, what happened if everything went south and the data was lost? How do you ever recreate that election or prove, you know, to, to, to verify how people voted and actually how, uh, you know, the, the, the vote turned out? And uh, so we consequently wind up uh, recommending to this to the um, to the legislature to the governor at the time that when we choose new voting equipment that it should be optical scan so you can have the best of the old and the new technology but you have to have the paper ballot as the ultimate audit trail um, so uh, that's what we wound up doing and I uh, was able to um, uh, to get new optical scan voting equipment for the state when I became secretary of state. But to see, go in the room and talk to the, the professors and the, the, the researchers who, who set up the room and who set up the, uh, the, the challenge and to hear how easily the systems were compromised was, was certainly disturbing and, and an eye opener. It certainly gives me pause as we go back to DC now uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm part of a task force to look at, uh, at elections and this is certainly gonna be a, a primary topic of conversation. The other thing I'll just say uh, finally, the one thing that, that really impressed me is how the, uh, the, the hacker community wants to be proactive at both identifying and 
and, and, and closing uh, vulnerabilities in our uh, cyber ecosystem. So I look forward to those, uh, growing those opportunities and, and making sure that we have a way uh, to have a, a vulnerability disclosure process at each of the, the, the government agencies. I think it's something that's long overdue and uh, that's something that I hope to work with you all on. on the On that last point, Jim, and I want to add, I, I told this story yesterday, some uh, reporter asked me, you know, are you out here to get all these hackers civically engaged? And I was like, what are you talking about? They already are, right? And, and the, the feedback and what y'all do for society is incredibly important. And we got to make sure that we can continue to build upon, upon that relationship. So and I, I think we want to try to come back um, as often as we can, and would love to see y'all up in D.C. as well. So I knew yesterday we had them uh, in a small room for two hours of completely unvetted questions and exchanges. It was amazing. It was magical. I wish we had two hours now. Uh, we're at about the T minus 15 minute mark. Um, really quickly, What's an example, we want examples of uh, positive and negative or effective proactive or reactive forms of engagement for the hacker community. And um, I, I, I remember over lunch you were talking about a, a good example of, of the, the risk of Vasanar. Can you quickly s explain an example of how hackers helped uh, you do your job and, and preserve U.S. interests? Sure. So this is something that I, I tackled pretty aggressively with, uh, with my my team once that we were be, became aware of the problem, and and again it was the, uh, the 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 research community, the tech community that that came to me and 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 made us aware of what was you know I'm sure done with good intentions uh, missed the mark. Uh, Watson are trying to use a uh, a Cold War legacy uh, a, a agreement to prevent uh, uh, dual use technologies from falling into the in the wrong hands when you try to uh, apply that to software and to uh, prevention of uh, uh, transferring intrusion control software, that it missed the mark. It didn't work. And here you had the uh, Department of Commerce that was, was charged with promulgating the, the rules and regulations of how this is going to work. Uh, during the comment period, the, the research community really stepped up the tech community really stepped up and, and made robust comments. And I can tell you, uh, I took uh, those comments and these challenges and the stuff that you brought to me, and with 124 of my colleagues, was able to organize a, um, a, uh, a dear colleague, a, a letter uh, to, again, to the Obama administration to, uh, to re really ask them to change course on uh, the addition of, uh, of these uh, controls that, uh, uh, and uh, now we're making slow progress in, in getting those, those controls uh, clarified. But it wouldn't have happened without the engagement of the, of the, um, of the technology community. I uh, just want to underscore, uh, never underestimate the, the value that you bring to the table in advising policymakers about what's going to work and what's not going to work or what we need to do to change course to, to, to close vulnerabilities. So there are 435 members of Congress uh, in the House, 100 members of the United States Senate. We all have varied uh, interests. We all have things we, per se, specialize in. And you, know, you have uh, a small group of us, uh, myself and, and Will and Mike McCall, um, uh, Dutch Ruppersberger, um, we have uh, Mac Thornberry, and uh, a couple others here there that that really get cyber and, and it, we've made it a primary focus of what uh, we do. And then you've got the next level down of, of members who um, recognize it's important, but it's not maybe per se their thing, but they want to know more about it and they want to be up to speed on it. And then you've, you, know, you have a, a significant number that it's not their thing, maybe it's never going to be their thing, but they still need good advice and, and people coming forward to, uh, to advise them in their staff. So I just wanted to close by saying, never underestimate the value that you can bring to the table in helping to educate members and staff about what the best policies are and what's going to work and what's not going to work. 
and and again, never assume that we're we uh, uh, that we know all the thousands of bills that are introduced in Congress each year. It's not possible. So if you hear something or you uh, become aware of a bill or idea that you think we need to uh, know about, I, be proactive about it and engage. And I just in closing, I just ask you just you know just uh, rhetorically. You know, how many of you have ever made an appointment with your member of Congress or their staff or written an email or, or made a phone call? You know, I would just ask you to be uh, proactive because you can have uh, an impact and we want you to be engaged. Thank you. And then an important point in that story as well is, is that what, like, the process around this worked. The feedback that Commerce was getting instigated, um, some congressional hearings, the we, we Focus letter, and one of your own ended up going into the negotiating room in, in Europe uh, to, to try to fix this multilateral agreement. And so I think this is a, a, a great example of how the right engagement of really smart people fix a problem. Now, we're not completely there yet because we haven't signed the new, the new agreement, but I think we're going to try to sort that out in, in December. So it's an example of how the, the wheels of the process worked. Yeah. Now let's hear it for Katie Missouri because she was the one that, uh, that really helped in that. Yes, Katie, yeah. You, Katie. Katie Mo. Yeah. So, so, so Kay, I, I want a picture when you walk in with all these stuffy diplomats and your pink hair, you know, and, and make, sure, make sure you get that picture next time. Right. Now, that wasn't a good, you know, Karen Elizari says that hackers are the immune system of the internet, right? We're the, uh, um, so we flocked to a, a dangerous threat to the, the way we do our jobs in security in this particular case. But on some of these, we want to get in front of them. Uh, so for our part where we, it looks like the Twitter poll was a pretty tight race here. Um, the, the winner was concerns over our uh, power utilities uh, infrastructure. So in the US and, and other countries, these are designated critical infrastructure and are very, very important, but they're often privately owned and operated uh, and often quite exposed. Um, it's a pretty close vote with uh, also Mirai's effect on taking out the internet for a day. These low cost, low hygiene devices, there's so many of them now with the internet of everything. Um, and then also the, uh, the WannaCry type hospital outages where it's just too easy for these things. We tend to summarize these at the Atlantic Council that our over-dependence on undependable things is exposing us to accidents and adversaries uh, that could be a national security level event. Um, instead of us flocking to maybe go you know, stop bad Vassanar, what's, what are the appropriate mechanisms or most effective mechanisms for us to proactively engage with members, with their staffs, with committees? It's a bit of a, a confusing and nebulous thing for us. If you could give us some succinct advice of what, where to get started or what's worked to date for, for us bringing topics so that we don't wait for hospital outages. Sure, I would go back to what I uh, touched on just a few minutes ago. You know, don't wait till maybe something uh, comes to your attention to start engaging with your members of Congress and their staff. Introduce yourselves ahead of time. Get to know uh, them. Let them get to know you and develop a uh, report. Develop a uh, open up a dialogue so that you know you've already established that 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 you know that uh, that rapport, that trust, if you will. And so when something you know comes to your attention that is is seriousness is serious and it needs to get their attention right away you already have a point of contact you don't have to go searching for who uh, that person is on many of these issues that you just went through there is a lack of a proper strategy on how to deal with it and so let's start with let's start with doing something to industrial controls within the utility group so was three years ago, two years ago, there was, this was no longer a philosophical exercise. The Russians did it in the Ukraine. If you look at the UN, the UN says there's certain things that are an act of war. It is fooling with somebody's grit. Is an act of war according to the UN? What was the response to the Russians when they did that? Nothing. The sanctions that were put in and the, the sanctions that we just strengthened um, in, in the House uh, this, this week, 
um, was not because of that. And so, so if, if, you don't, if you don't articulate what a response is going to be to a certain red line, um, that, that's a form of deterrent. And so, so what should an actual response be in, in, that, in, that, um, in that case? And, and there's all kinds of conversations around it, but there's not an accepted uh, policy at the NSC that would ultimately drive this. Now, folks in Congress, we can be shining light on this and, and talk through these issues. It's, um, it's the Homeland Security Committee, it's the, which, which we're on. Um, it's the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, where I chair a, a subcommittee there. It's Energy and Commerce, and it's also uh, Science and Technology, right? But Homeland and OGR are two of the ones that do the bulk of, of, some, of, this, of some of this work. And so it's important to educate us, the individual members of Congress, but we also need y'all sitting down with some of the staff that uh, populate these committees, sitting down with GAO. You know, GAO is, is basically the inspector general of the entire government, and then every department has IGs as well, but these are the folks that are looking at kind of the holes in policy, the holes in, 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 in tactics, techniques, and procedures when it comes to defending a digital infrastructure. Um, so, so that, we, we, we need to help, we need to be talking about what's the strategy, so then, then we can start talking about the tactics and how we, how we should be, what, who should be responding um, to what. And this is another problem when it comes, with, comes along with disinformation. The Russians are trying to erode trust in our institutions, period, end of story. And how do we deal? We do not have a counter covert influence strategy. And many of y'all in this room can help and have dealt and have, have operated in some of these communities that we could be leveraging intelligence from and, and talking about. So we, we, don't have, we don't have a strategy there. So that's, that's something that I'm concerned with because guess what, we're gonna see this in um, 2018, and it's not just the Russians. We know other nation states um, have tried to do this. And based on what was demonstrated in the last 48 hours, we gotta tighten up some of these voting machines as well. So all, all this stuff is connected, and, and nobody has the right answer, but talking to folks that live and breathe this is is important and so so committee staff's important the legislative director wherever y'all live you're a member of congress you should know the the district director um, you should know the legislative director for your member those are two people that drive the policies um, of those offices yeah and who on their staff is the the point person that deals with uh the, the, the research uh community uh, issues in particular and I just want to say something else, if I could, just to underscore what Will had said. Uh, it, what the Russians did was, was, it was outrageous, it was wrong, and they are going to keep doing it, particularly if they're not uh, hit hard enough, that if they don't uh, get uh, strong enough sanctions or the messages and sent clear enough that we're not going to tolerate that kind of interference and undermining uh, our, our pillars of our democracy. And we have to look at uh, this holistically and say that as a nation state, we have a whole suite of options that we can that we could draw from uh, to uh, to retaliate to make the point that we're not going to uh, accept that kind of interference with our elections, and we need to make it uh, very clear uh, going forward. All right, we're reaching the end here. Um, boy, I wish we had three hours for this. Um, <laughs> So as we face these challenges, they're not going to slow down. I think while we were here, uh, one of the victims of NotPetya, it was Merck in the pharmaceutical industry, admitted that uh, material impact on the production of several of their drugs, this is designated critical infrastructure. Unrestrained cyber munitions got outside its intended target and affected U.S. critical infrastructure. These are the types of companies that make our pandemic vaccines and shots in case we have a national emergency. So as I look across this room, I see a lot of raw talent. And I know in general, we're loath to regulate, we're, we're loath to work with government. We uh, in general like the, the come as you are, do as you please type zeitgeist. I know a lot of the things that we see come on the news or on the Hill might have some rough edges. 
as things get very, very real, and as the consequences of failure get very, very high, I really encourage you to, to, to see that they're outreaching a hand and trying. And when they publish something or they ask a question, look for what's right in it and cultivate that. Uh, we're really, really good at what's finding wrong with something, but I think we're at the stage now where we have to make that outstretched hand and go that extra mile and meet in the middle uh, if we're gonna rise to meet these challenges together. So I see what we've done here, maybe as a coal or a little ember, a little bit of heat and light, we can either snuff it out or we can foster it and grow it uh, into a real vibrant collaboration here. Um, we have now brought DC to DEF CON. I'm trying to make it happen so we can bring more of DEF CON to DC. Perhaps we could turn this into a regular thing, maybe a cyber caucus in the summer here. Maybe a cyber caucus in DC around ShmooCon, just saying. Uh, but if you like this, <laughs> look, when we said four years ago the cavalry isn't coming, it meant it fell to you. It wasn't to be depressed, it falls to you. So if we see something missing in the world, we gotta put it there. I hope this is the start. I respect and admire every single person in this room. I respect and admire our colleagues in DC. This has got to be the beginning. We've been amazing for 25 years. Who are we going to be for the next 25? Thank you.